Hey guys, what is up? Faiz here from Races with Data. Today I have an interesting one for you. This is going to be a two-part video where we are first going to understand this graph right here, which is typically how the lateral G and longitudinal G is shown in MoTeC. And in the second video, we are going to use what we have learned from this video and explore these graphs which are actually just a variation of the lateral G channel and see how they can be helpful to help us improve our driving. So let's get to it. To make sure everyone is on the same page, let's start with the basics. What is lateral G? How is it different to longitudinal G? And what is the G at the end stands for? So lateral G is what you feel when you take a corner. If you turn right, you feel a force pushing you to the left. And then likewise, if you turn left, you feel a force pushing you to the right. That force is the lateral G force. Longitudinal G, on the other hand, is the force that you feel when you accelerate and brake. These channels are essentially a recording of how strong these forces are. Now instead of measuring these forces in newtons, which is the unit for force, we only measure the acceleration as recorded by an accelerometer. Uh, the reason for this is because an accelerometer is much easier to mount, it's lightweight and is very very sensitive and very precise. We normalize the acceleration so that 1g is equivalent to 9.8 meters square, which is the acceleration of gravity. So when we say you're experiencing 1g, that means you are experiencing a force equal to your weight. A fun fact, the measurements that we see in MoTeC isn't actually the force that you feel if you're sitting in the driver's seat. Uh, instead, it's actually the force experienced by the car, as generally the accelerometer is placed at the center of gravity of the car, not at the center of gravity of you. So what this does is it allows the engineer to validate their calculations and simulation about the car. In real life, the, these engineers, they actually can predict what the maximum lateral G of the car is based on the suspension setup, the geometry of the suspension, the aerodynamic components that they have, the setup of those aerodynamic components, and of course, the data from the tire manufacturers. So in real life, what happens is the drivers can actually use this lateral G channel to know if they are truly at the limit of grip or if they can push harder. Unfortunately for us in the sim world, we don't have access to this theoretical maximum. What we do have is a recording of how good or how bad we drove. So how should we utilize this recording to improve our driving? Well, let's jump into MoTeC and have a look. When we open up MoTeC, the lateral and longitudinal G is presented as a distance time chart, similar to the speed channel. The way to read the chart is as follows. For the lateral G, a positive value indicates that we are in a left-hand turn and hence experiencing a force pushing the car to the right. We can confirm this by adding the steering wheel angle graphic and this way we can see that the wheel is indeed turning to the left and that the lateral G is in the positive value. A negative value means that we are in a right-hand turn and that the car is experiencing a force pushing us towards the left. The steering wheel graphic again confirms this. For a longitudinal G, a positive value means we are in acceleration while a negative value means we are decelerating or braking. Since we're going to look at the lateral G mainly, uh, we'll keep the longitudinal G channel hidden. Now the left hand side of the channel is the closest to the start line and the right hand side of the chart is closest to the finish line. And the first curve that we encounter on the graph, positive, negative, it doesn't really matter, it means that that's the first corner that we uh, encounter on track. And then the second and third curve is then the second and third corner. So one common advice that you will often hear when analyzing the lateral G channel is to try your very best to have the lateral G peaking at the same value for each corner. Why is this? Well, since we don't have access to the theoretical maximum, the next best thing for us is to take the maximum peak that we achieve in our run as the limit of the car. Now the assumption here is that if the car can do 
2.1G for example in one corner, then there's no reason for the car not being able to achieve 2.1G in the other corners. And this is why we try to match all the corners to hit the same lateral G or the same peak value for lateral G. This assumption is valid for both left hand and right hand turns, especially if you have a car that is uh, symmetrical in its setup. The assumption would not work if let's say you achieve the maximum lateral G on a cambered corner. So with a cambered corner, you can normally take the corner faster and this means that you can achieve a higher lateral G compared to a non-cambered corner. And that's why you also have to keep in mind, is the lateral G value, this peak that you have, is it done on a cambered corner or not? Just keep that in mind. Before we continue, I just want to say thank you for watching my YouTube video. If you do find contents like this helpful, please do leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Also, comment below about what MoTeC channels you want to see. Uh, I really want to help you guys out with MoTeC, so by letting me know what you want to see will really help me to help you. Now, back to the video. As always, our analysis should center around the fastest lap and have overlays of laps within 0.5 seconds of each other. We want to identify which corner that we are consistently not maximizing the car's performance and hence potentially losing time. Now, it can get messy if you start overlaying all, this, uh, all those laps together. I'll show you an example here. Uh, I'll put all of them together and then it gets really messy really quickly. And if you see this mess, it's really hard to do any real analysis. What I like to do is instead of having all of them together or all of them loaded up, I would just go one by one uh, and then have this measurements uh, label appearing. So the measurements label, you can go to display and then show measurements or you can click on M and it will appear. Now this measurements, it will tell you what is the maximum and what is the minimum in, in a very simple view. Now, what is interesting is that you can quickly jump from one lap to another and see, all right, uh, for example, here, my highest left-hand turn is at 2.23G and I achieved it in this corner right here. But this lap, 156.9, a bit slower, but then I can achieve 2.27. And here, interestingly, the 2.27 is not at um, the recorded so that means there's potential that I can push a bit more for this corner and gain a bit of time there so this is how I would approach this and as you can see it's a bit finicky it's not really precise it doesn't really tell you okay what exactly you have to do it just tells you is there uh, potential performance there or not and that is why in the next video we will explore the different layouts that you can use where you can extract a bit more information from the lateral G channel. So some of you would notice that I am specifically looking only on the left hand turns uh, for the maximum values here and that is to do with the assumptions. The assumption here is that the maximum value recorded in the lateral G is the theoretical limit and as with all assumption, the assumption will work for most cases but it wouldn't work for all cases. And a fine example for this is the right-hander at Paul Ricard. And that is why I deliberately not showing you the, uh, in the analysis, the right-hand turns. Now, if you see the lateral G here is about 0.6 G higher compared to the rest of the lab. Hmm. I wonder why that may be the case. If you guys can think of why that may be, uh, write down in the comments below. In the next video, we'll be looking at this exact corner and see how we can plot the lateral G in a different manner to handle this sort of situation. And we will also look at how we can mix different channels with the lateral G, which can help us improve our trail braking and also improve our cornering performance, for example. So I hope you find this video helpful. Thanks again for watching and I will see you in the next video.